Look, I'm going to start this by saying I'm really interested in what you all are going to say about this one. When True Blood first came out, I couldn't remember a horror show getting this much love and buzz. It was kind of a phenomenon. The show was part of the vampire resurgence. Guess we kind of cycle through monsters though, right? I think the zombie fandom has calmed down a little bit finally. <laughs> So I restarted my True Blood journey and I started thinking, why did I like this so much? Then before you know it, I was full blown back into it, just as passionate. Oh, but you have other very juicy arteries. There is one in the groin that's a particular favorite of mine. Hey, you just shut your nasty mouth, mister. You might be a vampire, but when you talk to me, you will talk to me like the lady that I am. Running into the room, announcing the things that got me excited in my first go around. I could not stop watching it. So with that said, let's begin our descent. True Blood was adapted from the series, The Southern Vampire Mysteries by Charlene Harris, or very loosely adapted according to many fans of the book series. Here's a logline for those unaware of the series. True Blood centers around Sookie Stackhouse, a telepathic waitress living in rural Bonton, Louisiana, and years after a synthetic blood, True Blood, it's developed that allows vampires to reveal their presence to mankind. So he ends up falling in love with 174 year old vampire Bill Compton, something that turns her life upside down. That's like the very bare minimum to say the least. Um, the series came to fruition after writer director Alan Ball was contracted with HBO after Six Feet Under to create original content. Before a trip to the dentist, Harris's book Dead Until Dark caught Ball's eye in a Barnes and Noble. He picked it up, got hooked, and decided he wanted to regurgitate his vision to the world. The series already had two other options on the table, but ultimately Harris went with Ball as she felt like he understood what she was trying to convey the most. There are quite a few things to love about True Blood. It is the utmost trashy trash trash, but man is it compelling. There are these big shocking moments or just book wild moments. It's far from Skin and Max Light. I mean, if you've watched it, We've all seen a lot of The Secret Garden. We've also got a high booby count. I mean, I wonder what the official breast count is. Someone do the math and let me know. It's like 3,000 or something. It, it, it felt that way. I should have kept count. Anywho, I'm sure that was definitely a big draw for some, and it might have been a little overdone at times, but it's kind of in the realm of trashy romance novel territory. It was an interesting contrast to Twilight, which came out a couple of months later. Not touching that one. For me, True Blood was all about how the actors got me attached to the characters. No matter how absurd it got, I was emotionally invested. Also, really the setting and characters were familiar. As someone from the South, I felt like I had crossed paths with several of these people. There were certainly quite a few Jason Stackhouses, though the Jasons I knew were not nearly as attractive. The actors did a wonderful job and were so brilliantly casted. I also trust Alan Ball solely based on his work with Six Feet Under. If you haven't checked that one out, by all means, please do. I also found some of the political and social parallels to be just as relevant, if not more relevant. I'll just put that one down for you and you can bounce it around like a beach ball at a concert if you feel so inclined. What's also interesting is this is the first show I can remember that had a companion podcast, minisodes, documentaries, cookbooks, retrospectives, and everything else that is now kind of standard with a show of that magnitude. I saw the True Blood panel in 2009 at Comic-Con, and not only are those a beautiful cast of people, but they marketed the hell out of that show. They released True Blood as a blood orange soda, Blockbuster did a free rental of the first episode before it actually premiered. They went all out. I remember girls dressed as Merlot's waitresses at Con and for Halloween. I remember every night I would talk about the episodes with my friends online. It was kind of a big deal. And last but not least, that theme. Have a nice day now. Man, at first I thought it was just kind of dumb, but it gets stuck in your head and fits rather perfectly with the show. Opening credits and everything. That song played everywhere. I believe it was rated once as one of the top 10 opening themes of all time. Here we go now with our favorite episodes. Remember, spoilers, because, I mean, we gotta talk about it. You'll Be the Death of Me, Season 1, Episode 12. We went through a lot of shit this season. Sam's naked butox revealed that he was a shapeshifter. Tara and Letty May's exorcism saga, which stuck with and tore my heart out at times. But, you know, no pun intended for Season 2, though it tracks. Bill and Sookie get it on, and now Sookie belongs to Bill. 
Amy dies after a final V-trip with Jason, and it breaks him. Stephen Root shows up as Bill Dotrieve. I'm so depressed I can't even blink. Gran dies like five episodes in. We've been through the ringer and we're fully committed at this point. In this episode, the conclusion of the Fangbanger killings comes to an end. As much as I did not want it to be Renee, it's Renee and we knew a few episodes ago probably. The chase beginning at Sookie's house into the cemetery gets you kind of worked up, even though you know Sookie's going to have some kind of aid because like 20 dudes are into her. Watching Bill struggle to get to her to help just kind of sucks, but you know he's going to be okay. Everything starts to seem like it's going to go to a good place. Tara's picked up by Marianne and she meets Eggs and you think this is going to be great for her. She's gone through so much and she needs a break. Everyone's at Merlot's and they're happy. Terry says one of my favorite lines to Arlene. Your hair is like, like a sunset, sunset after, after a ball, ball went off. Pretty. Oh, and Reverend Steve Newland and the Fellowship of the Sun come into our lives. We will not rest until we have brought God's holy light down on each and every blood-sucking abomination. Cold Gray Light of Dawn, Season 4, Episode 7. Marnie and Tonia get out of the holding cell. We find out that Lafayette is a medium and has some kind of magic inside him, according to Jesus' T.O., which confirms that his mom, played amazingly by Alfre Woodard, kept indicating. Alcide and Debbie Light go to check up on Suki, only to find out that she's getting it in the woods with Eric. They all gotta get chained down, and one of the best scenes is when we cut to Pam freaking out in her coffin, and Ginger jumps on top of it, keeping her from coming out. The coffin then starts shaking with her on it, and she's screaming. There's actually quite a few great scenes in this one. Lafayette experienced his first spirit, as well as the crowd with their cell phones recording Pam's fight with Tara and her girlfriend. Everything is Broken, Season 3, Episode 9. While this is a good episode, the ending is what makes it great. After Eric hears the good news that the Authority has decided that they would rather forget and sweep the killing of the Magister and Sophie Ann under the rug, Eric promises to kill Russell. After him and his pack of bee-fueled wolves did kill his entire family. As Nan is on her way over to the airport, she's listening to a newscaster while thigh deep in her dinner when Russell Edgington blasts his hand through said newscaster, pulling out part of his spinal column and heart. He shouts not to turn off the camera and demands the last two minutes of the episode to focus on him. He tells the American public that vampires are superior and in no way equal to humans. He does this in such a dramatic and grandiose way that only Russell could, which lends a million props to the man behind the performance, Dennis O'Hare. At the end, his tone shifts to being more upbeat and he turns it over with... Now time for the weather. Tiffany? Bill also tells Suki she's a fairy, which is underwhelming to her. I'm a fairy? How fucking late. But especially when he also refers to fairies as aliens, to which in the next episode she says, God fucking damn it, I really am an alien. I Will Rise Up, Season 2, Episode 9. Two really major things happen here. First, after the explosion in Godric's nest, Eric convinces Sookie that he is unable to heal from the silver shards in his body. Sookie, Sookie very, very reluctantly sucks the shards out of Eric's body. This whole scene is insanely great. The fact that Sookie is buying into Eric's bullshit to her complaining about sucking out the shards to him, just cheesing at Bill as she's doing it. Sookie is utterly disgusted when Bill tells her that Eric only did it so that she would be tied to him as well as she ingested some of Eric's blood. I know, I said that there are two major things, but I'm going to list a minor. Yet memorable thing is Marianne entering the jail on the hunt for Sam. Michelle Forbes' performance as Marianne is so devious and delightful that it's hard to hate her. I am really irritated. The other major thing is Godric being sentenced to the true death. Even though Suki was grossed out by Eric's scheme, she still finds it in her big ol' softy southern heart to go up to the roof and stay with Godric as long as it takes. Though Godric isn't around the series for terribly long, you understand his shift in views as well as why Eric adores him so much. You also get the human side of Eric without dumbing his character down, which happens later, though I'm not going to complain about it, but you have to know that I did. Escape from Dragon House, Season 1, Episode 4 While the first episode of the season does manage to successfully take hold of us, I think Episode 4 is one of the best. The episode starts with Suki walking into Dawn's bedroom only to find her dead on the bed. Jason, in the right place at the wrong time, is taken to jail yet again by Bud and Andy. Jason, who has been dabbling in V, downs an entire vial full, so this doesn't further incriminate him if they find it. 
The result leads to one of the most humorous occurrences of the series, Jason's forever boner. This gets him laughed at by Lafayette, and Tara is just shocked and amazed on so many different levels. She winds up taking it upon herself to help him with this issue after seeing him uncover it in the deep freeze. She ends up taking him to the hospital where they have to drain his member with a needle. Three, two... <laughs> Suki asks Bill to take her to Fantasia so she can ask some vamps if they knew Dawn or Claudette. This is where we first get to see Eric and Suki interact, and where Suki also uses her telepathy to help Eric and Pam. Oh, and at the end we see Sam doing some real weird shit, so obviously he's either the killer or he's transformed into a bigger creeper. I think this improves later on in the series. I have so many others, mostly in between seasons 1 and 5. The second to last episode of season 7 is probably one of my favorites because it reunites Jessica and Hoyt. There's just a lot of emotions there. You see the growth and it's as convincing as it can be. Also, any episode where Ryan Quantin has a moment to shine LET HER GO FUCKWAD <laughs> is well worth the time. So, where can you watch this beautiful thing? This one's pretty readily available. If you have HBO Max and you're good to go. If not, then Prime, YouTube, all the things. Every season was also released on DVD as well. You can get more special features there, but you can also dig them up on YouTube, I'm sure. So, how did it end? Is there anything new on the horizon? Unlike our previous shows, True Blood was not cancelled due to dwindling ratings. The shocker here is that the creative team decided to pull the plug because they felt the show had hit a wall and there wasn't anywhere else they could go. Definitely a commendable thing. They could have gone to season 12 and then finally decided, well, I think we're done here. I can tell you that for me, after season 5, I was kind of spent. I still kept going because these were characters that I had seen evolve and of course I stay for all the dumb reasons like, well, so he decided to be with Eric or Bill or neither. The answer is, is neither, though her torch for Bill shone more brightly. Hard to disagree, but that's here nor there. All in all, the ratings stayed through most of the seasons, and the show was just as popular on HBO as The Sopranos was. So they just bowed out before it got too painful. However, it was announced in December of 2020 that a reboot of True Blood was planned with Riverdale and Chilling Adventures of Sabrina creator Roberto Guerra Sacasa at the helm. Also, before you ask, because I would have wanted to know as well, original True Blood showrunner Alan Ball is on as executive producer for the new series. As of February this year, there are no real concrete details and it doesn't seem like much progress has been made. Several ideas for how the reboot could go have been kicked up, but nothing has been greenlit. Seems like they're taking their time on this one as well. I would be kind of surprised if it actually got off the ground. It's nice because there's so many different types of creatures you can play with or even introduce. Another thing to think about is that there hasn't been much distance in regards to how long the show has been off air. One of my personal favorite reboots, also vampire related, was Dark Shadows. Well, they called it a revival. The original run ended in 1971 then came back to life in 1991. That one did not last long at all. Big ol' three months, but who knows, maybe True Blood 2.0 could be all the rage. You know, what's magical about True Blood is how you can leave these characters and then come back and feel like you never left. Some horror shows uh, later on wind up being cheesy and hard to watch as time goes on, and, and even though this one hasn't been off air as long, I believe it will still be just as good 10 years down the road. The show is witty, doesn't stray from violence, gore, and handles topics that are still prevalent today quite brilliantly. We care about the journey that each of the characters goes on, and we're rooting for even the worst of them. And also, don't you miss the way Bill would say Suki? Suki. Until next time, my creepy companions. Oh.